Welcome everyone to Evaluate to Motivate Part 2. I'm not going to let you know what the word of the day is, but I'll just give you a little hint. <laughs> Resilient. It is Mental Health Day hat day on Wednesday. We have the honor and the privilege of having Dennis Dawson back for part two of our workshop. Dennis will start the introduction <laughs> off with Actually, he's going to do a recap of what we learned last time from Dennis, and then we're going to go into our first speech. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Dennis Dawson. Oh, that was short and sweet. Thank you. Let me share my screen here. I hope. There we go. I assume you can see my slide. You can still hear me. Life is good. Okay. So we are going to talk about evaluations, which we will remember are the heart of Toastmasters. So when you're preparing your evaluation, very important that you pay attention and be visible as you're paying attention so that the speaker knows that you're actually listening to them. It's very important. You're going to take your notes, and I have that specific method of taking notes that I'll show you in a bit. Uh, pay attention to the audience, not just the speaker, to see how they are responding and empathize with the speaker who's up there doing the best that they possibly can. Now, this is the note-taking form that I use. Again, I just take a sheet of paper and I probably won't be able to show this to you effectively, but you divide it in half down the middle, have a positive side, negative side. I draw an eyeball, an ear, and a, a heart or a hand for what I saw, what I heard, and what I felt. And I jot down anything that I thought was a positive thing I saw, anything that was a negative thing that I saw, and just be sure that I capture them as specifically as possible as the speech is going on. Now, once they're finished with the speech, I go back and write up my notes. The first thing I do, number one, is the summation. Here are the two things that I thought were good. Here are two things that could be even better. And the one thing I thought was best of all in the speech. Uh, this is the sandwich method that you've heard so much about and the one that I, I recommend most of all. After you've got the summation done, write the conclusion, come up with something witty, pithy, something stylish. When you have the conclusion, you can then go back and write the introduction. That way you're going to have a nice set of bookmarks on either side of the speech and that gives it more of the feel of a speech rather than uh, simply a report that you're going on. Yeah. Then you can spend the rest of your preparation time working on the body of the evaluation, fleshing it out as much as possible. Again, getting the specific examples in there because the more specific you are, the more likely the person is going to understand exactly what you're giving them feedback on. Yeah. Uh, again, be specific. When you give your evaluation, use I language throughout. I saw, I heard, I felt. Don't speak uh, for the entire audience. You're just giving your own personal opinions. And the nice thing about giving your personal opinions is you can never be wrong. If you try to speak for the audience, someone out there is probably not going to agree with you. But if you're speaking for yourself, well, that's just your opinion. And that is just your opinion. Remember, there are no experts in Toastmasters. There are no professors and no teachers. This is a self-learning organization. All we do is hear feedback from our peers. I prefer to have the evaluations in second person, talking directly to the person. This is what I saw in your speech. These are the areas that I thought you could do even better, as opposed to speaking in third person. And the reason for that is when you're speaking in third person, it 
sounds like third person invisible, where you're talking about somebody in the room instead of to them. It's like when you go and visit your mother-in-law's house for the first time, and she's constantly asking your wife, does he enjoy spaghetti? Does he always sit like that? Yeah, so we don't want our evaluation to come off like a critical mother-in-law. And the eye language helps with that. Give your own personal examples. So you can say, this is what works for me when I have a similar situation in my speech, rather than telling other people what they should do. Don't summarize the speech. This is something you'll see every now. First, you told us about what you did in grammar school. Then you went on to talk about high school. Then you talked about college. And finally, you talked about your job. Well, that's the speech we just heard. So we don't need you to summarize the speech. You can pull out elements of the speech that you thought were particularly effective. And avoid the temptation to rewrite the speech. You were talking about your experience through school. It would have been much more interesting to me if you talked about what you did outside of school. Okay, well, that's terrific, except that's not the speech that the speaker wanted to give. So evaluate their speech, not the speech that you would have given if you were them. And remember, there are certain things that I personally hope are stricken forever from Toastmasters lingo. You drew us in. That is a meaningless phrase. Just uh, talk about what intrigued you, what piqued your interest. But you drew us in is just something Toastmasters say to Toastmasters when they don't know what to say to a Toastmaster. Just like use the stage. Anytime you hear somebody say that, they're just drawing at straws trying to come up with something to criticize the speaker about. If they specifically were moving in an improper fashion, that would be one thing you would want to give them feedback on. Or if you uh, think that you can give specific blocking that would help with the speech, that would be fine. But just telling them to use the stage more is, is not helpful. In Zoom, that's the equivalent of saying you have to stand up when you speak. Well, some speeches are improved by standing up, but personally, I've been giving all of my speeches while seated during the COVID era. That's just the way it works in Zoom. So it's a matter of personal preference, but I, you can't just immediately say, because you sat down, you made a mistake in your speaking. Talk about whether or not it was effective in this particular presentation. At the end of your evaluation, summarize your key points. A lot of people then, they don't know what to say, so they say, I look forward to your next speech because they've heard other Toastmasters say that to other Toastmasters. All you have to say is Toastmaster and pass it back that way. So you can practice just handing it back to the Toastmaster instead of being caught with nothing else to say there at the end of your evaluation. Uh, 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 come on, there we go. And I will take us back to the radical camber compass. This is to remind you that the most important thing we can do is show people that we care, but challenge them to help them to improve. If you challenge people, but you don't show them that you care, you're being obnoxious. If you don't challenge them directly and you don't care about them, that's insincere manipulation. Oh, your speech was fine. It was fine. Then you go to post toasties and you talk smack behind their back. That's terrible. The worst thing we do in Toastmasters is care deeply, but don't challenge directly. That's called ruinous empathy. This is where we tell people they're wonderful. That's great. Best speech I ever heard when it really wasn't very good. And there are specific things you could suggest that would make the speech even better. We have a tendency to do this particularly when we're giving evaluations to people for whom English is not their first language. So if there is something you can help them with that's going to help them with their diction, that's going to help them with their word choice, help them with their pronunciation of certain words, we shouldn't shrink away from that. We should, in a caring and loving manner, give them real feedback that's going to help them to improve. Now, are there any immediate questions before we jump into our speeches? No, okay, that's great. Well, I'm going to 
then what we'll see is, I believe we're going to have a speaker and then a single evaluator. I'll give feedback on the evaluation and another speaker, another evaluation. Oh, three, three evaluators on one speech. Okay. So that's where we'd like to draw numbers. So if you'd like to put a number in the chat and then we'll have the three evaluator or just pick a number in your head. Yeah, drill it in there. And then our three evaluators will pick a number put a number in chat to you and then you can put them in order however you want. Okay. I don't know why. It's all good. Thank you very much, Dennis. That was a great recap of what was our first workshop. Next is our first speaker, Ravi. Ravi is first place winner for Division D International Speech Contest in District 101. He was the District 101 finalist for the Humorous Speech Contest a club mentor for NVIDIA International, current vice president of education for NSpeak, current pre president for Agile Articulators, and the Toastmaster for over seven years. Madam Timer, the time is five to seven minutes, and the title is Waves of Fear. Please. Welcome, Ravi Adusomili. Suddenly, a big wave comes and takes away my daughter. In one instant, she's playing on the beach, and on the second, she's 20 feet away from the shore. With every passing second, she's moving away from the shore. She is my only child. Toastmasters and guests, this is the story of my fear. Growing up, I used to go swimming with my grandfather in a big river. That day, one of my younger cousins joined us. He's so good at swimming, he kept swimming across the river. And I started following him with fake swimming. Fake swimming is just like swimming, except you don't use your feet to swim. Instead, you use them to walk on the riverbed. This guy is swimming like this. And I am swimming like this, looking at him and overtaking him. Suddenly, my feet stopped touching the riverbed. In an instant, I thought I learned how to swim. But when I realized my head going underwater, I confirmed I was drowning. The next thing that I remember, I'm looking deep into my grandfather's eyes, who is giving me a resuscitation. A resuscitation is like mouth to mouth French kiss, except the receiver is unconscious. And it is pretty traumatic to learn that your grandfather is your first kisser. That was the first day I saw my fear. Fear of water. I have decided to avoid my fear and never go close to it. 20 years later, on my honeymoon in Mavi, my wife said, honey, let's go swimming with the dolphins. In swimming with dolphins, they take you to a tank full of dolphins. The dolphins come to you, you take pictures with them and you're done. But for this package, they put us on a boat made us wear wetsuit, life jacket, snorkeling gear, and they took us into the ocean. Some of these guys are so intense, they were spitting into their goggles. I said, wow. The instructor 
took us to the edge of the boat and said, you're going down in three. I looked at my wife with disbelief. She looked at me with excitement. One, two, and my wife pulled me on two. The guy who never wanted to be in a bathtub is now in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I can't see a thing through these foggy goggles because I did not spit into them. I can't breathe because my snorkeling gear is upside down and I can't swim. That day, my wife had to rescue me that day. I was not drowning in the water. I was not drowning in the water because I'm having my life jacket. I was drowning in my own fear, fear of water. This incident forced me to learn swimming and made me to train for an year. Recently, my family went to the beach to celebrate my daughter's seventh birthday. My wife and I are watching my daughter play on the beach, sitting a hundred feet away. Suddenly a big wave came and took away my daughter. In one second, she was playing on the beach and on the next, she's 20 feet away from the shore. Immediately, I ran towards her, jumped into the water, swam towards her and caught, out of, caught hold of her. I was holding her in my left hand and I was swimming with my right. No matter how hard I try, the waves keep pulling us back. We are stuck in these waves for 15 minutes, struggling to escape from its grip. My biggest fear at the time was letting go of my daughter. Finally, the waves got tired of toying with us and tossed us onto the shore. I looked at my daughter to see if she's all right. She is smiling. There I was, lying on the shore, breathing heavily, thinking deeply. What would have happened if I hadn't overcome my fear? What would have happened if I did not learn how to swim? What would have happened if I was not ready? This incident made me realize fear is a lot like waves. They are huge, strong, scary, and sneaky. And there is no way around them. The only way is over them. You can't avoid waves in the ocean of your life. You can only overcome them. Toastmasters and guests, what is the story of your fear? Back to you, Toastmaster. Thank you, Ravi. I'll give everybody a minute. Joan, could you please put a number in chat between one and 10? Dennis, could you private chat me your number, please?
Thank you, everybody. Our first evaluator for Ravi's speech is Carolyn Riley. Please welcome Carolyn Riley. Ms. Madam Timer, two to three minutes. Sorry, we're sharing a, a computer, so it's a bit of a challenge at times. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster and fellow Toastmasters, especially you, Ravi. You gave us, or I heard you give us today, a wonderful speech using incredibly excellent body language, not just for Zoom, though it was that, but good body language were you to be standing up and presenting this. I found your emphasis by your movements, your facial gestures, your body gestures, enhanced your presentation extremely well. I really liked it when you talked about your fear being right there. Sometimes my fear looks kind of like that too. And it's certainly close enough to me uh, in, in some cases to accept that. I felt that the fear that you had for your child, uh, we had one child ourselves, and I know the fears that we have. My, I don't know how my mother-in-law survived with eight because having one was fearful enough. And so I understand your feeling and fear when you saw your daughter moving away from you, especially in the ocean. I really enjoyed your humor. You have good use of humor. And particularly when you talked about your first mouth to mouth being from your grandfather, <laughs> made me chuckle. I enjoyed that. I found there were times I wanted you to use a lower tone in your voice when you were talking about being fearful. It was just uh, your upper range. You are um, sort of a tenor sounding person to me as far as where you might be with singing. So I felt you could have used a lower tone when you were talking about something fearful and it just uh, might have given you more power with what you were talking about in that moment. I appreciate that you went and had swimming lessons. That would certainly be something I would need to do if it were me, because I don't swim and I don't uh, enjoy the water particularly. One part uh, where you said it made me to train in a year sounded confusing to me. Uh, if you had said it made me train for a year, I would have felt more that was more grammatically correct or I trained uh, to whatever level you train to in a year would have been fine also. It would have given us more of a, a timeline and more of an understanding. Your movement, when you talked about the power of the waves pushing you back once you had grasped your daughter, was powerful. I really appreciated that. That was probably one of your best moves in the whole speech and you had a lot of good moves in that speech. I think there might be a couple more um, preparatory sentences that you might want to put into your conclusion. 
prior to you saying, you can't overcome waves in the ocean of your life, but you can prepare yourself to uh, appreciate them or recognize that there will be objections or objectives that you need to overcome in your life. There needs to be a little more work on that to kind of tie that from your dramatic speech, which it was very dramatic, I felt, and into your conclusion and your question. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Carolyn. Our next evaluator will be Joan Petruk. Please welcome Joan Petruk. Thank you very much, Madam Toastmaster. Now, Ravi, I believe that we want feedback to help you at your district, right? Yes. Okay. I saw very strong body language and it supplements those of us who are visual because it brought your story along, made it very easy to understand. I heard a strong opening that made, gave me an idea of what you were gonna talk about. I liked the ending as well because I liked the way you closed it with a question to your audience. One thing that might be helpful in a contest is to work on your pauses. I found it sounded like you memorized your speech, you know it well, but when you're memorizing, we tend to sound almost like reading, but not quite. Reading is probably smoother, but we're remembering in bits. And those bits lead to small pauses. But I think if you practice that a lot, you can overcome that quite good and just make it. The best speakers in the world speak in conversational tones. So if you can get your voice to sound like you're talking to your friend when you're telling the story, I think it will, it, to me, it would come across a little bit smoother. I felt your story was very well organized and told the story that you wanted to tell. So my only suggestion would be to spend some time and just work on relaxing your voice and talking like you're telling your best friend a story. But the words are wonderful just doing that. Toastmaster. Thank you, Joan. Our next evaluator evaluating Ravi's speech is Max Riley. Please welcome Max. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster and Ravi. I enjoyed that speech. To start with, I thought you really drew me in with uh, your body language and your voice by bringing back those memories of my young son when he was young and my fears that I had with that. And I also thought that your, your body language was congruent with your words. Now, where, where I started losing touch with uh, what you were saying and, and, and where you were going is I didn't think that your intonation and your volume was quite congruent with your story. And one of the places that I thought you might have been able to do that 
is when you had turned and you look, you were looking at your daughter. That was an excellent move. But what I would have liked to have heard or, or seen you do there, and it's worked for me, is you lean into the camera and lower your voice so that people can barely hear you. And that really draws people in. And then you can punch us with, but she was smiling. And that just kind of draws it all together and, and brings that impact so that it's a visual, I hear it, and I get that heart feeling. I get it in all three ways. And I think that would really help uh, you with some impact in your speech. And you could have done that in a couple places, I felt. Um, I, like Karen, liked that you, you taught us or, or showed us that you had learned, were trying to learn how to swim and that you weren't a good swimmer. And that also tugged at my heart when you started thinking you were going to lose your daughter. It brought those two things together and really impacted me on how I, how I was perceiving your story at that moment, because it, it was very impactful with those two things for me. And so in, in summation, I, I think your speech went well for me. I, I, I enjoyed it. I was able to learn something about you and you became more of a human to me, brought that human, human factor into it. And I always like that when that happens. And I really do, and I have to bring it up again, that your best point was how you were able to bring your daughter's story forward even though it was terrifying to you, it wasn't to the daughter. And I thought that was what really wrapped everything all together in the emotions and brought your conclusion to a perfect ending. Because again, you asked us that question and brought it back to the individual and how did it impact me and how do I move forward from here? Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Max. So nice to see you back. <laughs> Dennis, would you like a feedback now before we get to our next speaker? Oh yeah, let me let me run through this. Wonderful. We have another speaker and three more evaluations. Is that that's right? correct? Oh okay. welcome back, Dennis Dawson. Okay. Yay, yay for me. Okay. So uh, briefly, so Carolyn. Uh, thank you so much for stepping up and doing the first evaluation after only one minute. This is, uh, we, we noticed, of course, that you ran substantially over time. If you had had more time, you would have been able to be more concise and succinct. It's like Mark Twain. If I'd had more time, I would have written a much shorter letter. So we appreciate that. Uh, one of the other things that I would love to see stricken from Toastmasters, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and especially you, Robbie. That's uh, Toastmasters trope that uh, uh, people use all the time. I would just suggest that you try not using that as you're introducing your uh, evaluation. There were several times, and I didn't mention this in my recap, uh, try to avoid empty superlatives. Like you were, you had incredibly excellent body language. Talk about the body language and describe what you thought worked particularly well, rather than just saying it was really, really incredibly excellent because none of those words actually uh, convey any useful information to the uh, recipient. Now I would, differ with you in some ways about how effective was the body language in that speech because something that everyone actually touched on to one degree or another is the incongruency and this is something that Max uh, said in particular between what was being said and 
the actual action that was uh, part of the speech. And this is actually a pretty significant disconnect for you, Ravi, in this particular speech. What I'm not seeing is your visualization of the action as it's unfolding. You're telling us a story, but I don't see you reliving the story as you do it. And as a result, there, there's an insincerity to it. So when you uh, use your vocal variety and you're uh, trying to convey emotion, it's what we call representational, where you're trying to act like you feel this way, as opposed to presentational, where you're actually feeling that way and displaying it for us. And this came up in various ways in all three of the evaluations. So I was happy to see all of you pick up on that because that's a great bit of feedback and something that you can work on before the uh, district finals. Joan, there were several things I really liked about your evaluation. Uh, you were specific about the things that you uh, thought worked particularly well, his strong opening and his call to action. When you said work on pauses, I, I'm going to extend that. Uh, this is to work on general fluidity. And you brought up the fact that this wasn't a very conversational speech. And I agree with that. The uh, ability to get up and speak to a group of 300 people and have each one of them feel as if you're speaking to them is very important when you're telling a personal story like this. And a lot of people think that you rehearse until you have it memorized and you're gold, but actually you have to rehearse twice as much. You have to rehearse until you have it so well memorized that you can make a mistake, recover, and nobody notices. So we're, we're talking about a higher level of preparation necessary when we get to the district level. Because remember, Ravi, you're not trying to win the district. You're trying to win the international speech contest and be the best speaker in the world. So it takes a great deal of effort and you don't win the uh, district and then prepare so that you can win the semifinals. You have to prepare to win the international and then do that at the district. So you know what you're going to be doing for the next couple of weeks before that, that contest. You're gonna be practicing this speech at least 10 times a day. And really, some people think, oh, if I practice that much, the spontaneity goes away. Actually, the opposite is true. When you have it so deeply ingrained, you can focus on the delivery and you don't have to think about the words as they come to you. And this is the fluidity that I, I believe that Joan was reaching for. Max, you uh, were purposely baiting me. Don't make me come over there. <laughs> yeah, you said, drew me in or draw us in, draw us all together three times in that evaluation. Now you did this on purpose just because you knew that it would uh, get my hackles up, but I'm gonna forgive you for that. I thought you made excellent use of eye language though. You, you did uh, present everything based on your own observations and not trying to tell people universal truths about uh, your great knowledge of speaking. So that was very well done. Uh, mm -hmm. At the end of your evaluation, this is something to watch for when you're uh, in a contest particularly, the summary should summarize your main points. Here are the two things I liked best. Here are the two things where you could improve. And of course, this is the thing that was fantastic. If you introduce a new idea, which you did in your summary, then uh, you're actually going to lose points at, at that point. And, and it kind of muddles the whole thing. So be sure that you summarize what, what you said and not introduce something new. It can be really tempting. And I actually made this mistake in a contest one time. There was one point I had forgotten to make. The red card is up and I threw it in there. I didn't go over time, but I took third place instead of first place. And that's probably the reason that, that it happened is that I, I messed up my, what could have been just a great uh, 
conclusion if I'd gone with it the way I said it, instead of trying to get that one extra piece of information in. So I sympathize with you there. All in all, you have uh, wonderful evaluations in this club. Uh, we need more people here to hear them. And we're going to hear more evaluations now, is that correct? <clears throat> Thank you, Dennis. Our next speaker is Melissa Matiko. Melissa has been fascinated by psychology and understanding why we do the things we do. From her own experience as an athlete to coaching others, she believes one of the most important keys for growth is to get the right information at the right time. Tonight, she is sharing her keys to knowing what you need. Madam Timer, the time is five to seven minutes. Her path, engaging humor, level two, content with your, connect with your audience. The title, Do You Know What You Need? Please welcome Melissa Matiko. I looked up. My husband was looking at me with that face. You know the face? The face that he's looking at me with this idea that there's something wrong, but I don't yet know that there's something wrong. The sympathy was in his eyes and said, are you okay? I didn't realize I had just let out a big sigh and that was why I was getting the face that I was getting. Do you know what you need? We're surviving a pandemic right now and are you aware of what you need? When we're talking about mastery, there are four different stages of mastery. There's unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, unconscious competence, and then conscious competence. Now, if you're confused at all by this, the four stages are basically, you don't know that you don't know. You start to realize that you don't know. You start to learn, but you don't yet know that you know. And then you know that you know. In our lives, we often think of mastering skills and we're thinking of, I'm going to learn to ride a dressage horse. Oh, wait, that's not something that your average person thinks. Um, let me put this in a different term. I'm going to learn to play the guitar. That's more common than a dressage horse. In the beginning, we are really, really bad. We really have to be terrible. If you're someone who's never played the guitar before and you go and you sit and you listen to this incredible performance, there will be a moment where you look at the person performing and you go, that looks really easy. If you can look at someone who's mastering something that you've never done before, that's the unconscious incompetence. It's the part where, because you're sitting there watching them make it look easy, you think, I can do that. All you have to do is pick up a guitar and you realize you very quickly go from that unconscious incompetent to the conscious incompetent. You realize that they made it look really, really, really easy, but it is not even close to that easy. After hours and hours and hours of practice and starting to get some of those really good calluses on your fingers so it doesn't hurt quite as bad, you can get to the point where you might be able to play a song or two, maybe a little twinkle, twinkle, little star, or ACDC. In your brain though, you're still convinced that you 
pretty much are terrible at playing the guitar. That's the part where unconscious competence comes in. The part where someone else goes, wow, you can play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star? I can't do that. And if you keep practicing long enough, you start to realize, hey, I'm actually getting kind of good at this. How does this transfer into, do we know what we need? In the world that we're facing right now, emotional intelligence and understanding what we need is really, really important. We're faced with disconnection from everyone. We end up having to do these calls with Toastmasters where we could get together and shake hands and now we're in a box. I have a best friend. And her and I like to play this game. This game that we like to play with each other is, which friend do you want me to be right now? The last time that it happened, we were talking about going on a trip. It was going to be an expensive trip. And Nicole said to me, which friend do you want me to be right now? Do you want me to be the enabler or do you want me to be that you really don't want to do this? It made me realize once we get to the point of conscious competence with what we need emotionally, we can then start to ask those around us to provide what we need. Sometimes it's a hug. Sometimes it's a word of encouragement. Sometimes it's just a little gift. Maybe it's even a five minute phone call. If we take these four steps of mastery and we apply them to our emotional lives and how we can survive in the world, in this pandemic world that we're in right now, we can begin to ask for what we need. We can make it significantly easier for those around us to provide what we need without having to guess. If you're married, how much easier is your marriage if your spouse just tells you what they need instead of you having to guess? If you're a parent and your child tells you what they need in the moment that they need something, rather than you having to guess, how much easier is that? The next time that you start to feel a little sad or a little down or a little overwhelmed by everything going on, think about these four stages of mastery. Unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, unconscious competence, and conscious competence. The goal is to get to where you are consciously competent in your emotional life as well. Do you know what you need? Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Melissa. We'll have a minute break. Margaret, Cheryl, and Janet, please, and Dennis, please privately chat me a number between one and 10. For everybody else, you are welcome in the chat to make comments to Melissa and Ravi on their speeches. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Timer. Our first evaluator for Melissa's speech will be Cheryl Friesen. Please welcome Cheryl Friesen. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Melissa, thank you for an interesting speech. There were some things that I really liked about your body language. The one where you, when you moved really close in, and you kind of whispered, I have really liked that because that really got my attention. I also liked when you talked about getting into the box and you did this and you talked about the box. It helped me understand what you're talking about. Sometimes what I felt was maybe a little rushed or a little almost confused because there was so much of the uncertain, unconscious, conscious, and there was a four of them. And when you put them all together for me, I'm trying to write them down and I can't even write them down fast enough. It was a little bit, that part was a little bit too fast. And I know you're trying to cover a lot of information in a really short period of time. And it's really good information. When you talked about your story, because you asked me to look for connection, if you connected with the audience, you told us about a friend and how you have the enabler, one's an enabler, or one saying like, are you sure you want to do this? You never actually told us which one you were or which one she was. So the story didn't quite complete for me. And I felt that you got a little bit rushed when you I think you had really great examples, but when you talked about marriage, um, you said how much easier it would be in your marriage if you just told somebody what you needed, but it would be really nice to have actually a really good story there. My recommendation in this case would be is maybe take it down to only two where you can elaborate a bit more because I thought you had good information. I just found that things were maybe a bit too rushed. I liked your title a lot. I do feel it did go with your speech. You asked me to look for connection with the audience and I didn't quite feel it. I think you needed to bring us in through those stories a bit better. I did like your speech. I did enjoy your gestures. I felt that you did move in and out and that was really good. I'd like you to slow down a bit more so we could really focus on those things because I think they're important and they are very interesting. And overall, I liked how you talked about your husband at the beginning and your face is all kind of crinkled up and you're really, he's trying to figure out what's wrong. And that's where you come in with, this idea. Thank you, Melissa. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Cheryl. Our next evaluator mm -hmm. for Melissa's speech is Janet Kraz. Please welcome Janet Kraz. Thank you. Very much, Melissa, for your inspiring speech about do you know what you know? Thank you very much. Every time I get to hear from you, I get, I learn something new, or I get a, a very classic motivational concept reinforced. And you did that for me today. The one I um in this particular speech, you're saying you're trying to connect with an unfamiliar audience. In some areas, you did very, very well. You have a warm style and a direct eye contact, which is really good. And you outlined the mastery model 
doing the, the, the four levels content. So it was very easy to remember and you repeated the full thing at least twice the cough. I hope I'm not freezing. Got a bad message. Second point that I saw, um, you slid in using your saw as an example, but then you switch to the guitar, which is more universally understood. And I thought that was good. Do keep in mind, though, that you're supposed to be speaking to an unfamiliar audience. That's an inside joke. We all know your love of such. But I got it. I got your joke. And then the two areas for, for personal improvement. Um, you are using relatable stories, but consider starting with asking a question of the audience to draw them in so they can start thinking. Has your spouse ever guessed, tried to try and guess what you're thinking or feeling? Something like that. And you bounced around a bit. It took me a while for me to realize that you were connecting the mastery model with emotional mastery. You wrapped it up with a sentence at the end, but I was trying to figure out why you were switching between emotions and mastery several times throughout your speech. You finally wrapped it up at the end, so you might want to have an intention sentence earlier on in your speech so that people can kind of see where you're heading with your thoughts. Well, sorry, you're good at aligning and, the des and describing models. Love the way you do it. Using the guitar as a model of confidence. Great choice. We can all feel it. Starting with a personal story is, re uh, is relatable. And bouncing, and bouncing back and forth from mastery to emotional competence, being a little more clear about that at the beginning would be helpful. So overall, thank you, Melissa, for your speech tonight. I am better informed. Back to you. Thank you, Janet. Our last evaluator of the night is Margaret Blackstaw, who will be evaluating Melissa's speech. Please welcome Mac Margaret. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. I have heard many speeches by Melissa, and I have always learned something. She's a very informative speaker. Today we learned about the mastery concept. What I noticed in Melissa's speech today is she had good gesture, she had good, her vocal variety, her leaning in, all of that worked as far as I could see. With her sitting, you don't see the full range of her hand motions, but that is what it is. What I noticed tonight with Melissa's speech is that she used a lot of pauses and it felt to me that the pauses were remembering what you were going to say. And it did hinder the flow because you would stop at a, after a, a section. Um, let me give you an example. Uh, where is it here? We need to tell people what we need. And then you'd wait and you didn't elaborate until a few seconds later. So the pauses caused a bit of confusion within, for me at least. I found that it didn't flow like you usually, your speeches are usually really smooth and flowing. Pauses work if they're for effect. Pauses don't work if. And the reason I'm saying this is because I'm really bad at this. I'm sure anybody that has watched me do a speech will admit that I pause when I forget. And it's better than saying, maybe better than saying, um, but it, it does hinder the flow of the speech. What I was hoping for in this speech and what I was feeling was enthusiasm for the mastery. I heard the enthusiasm for the mastery components and all of that, but I would have loved your conclusion to tell us what happened at the beginning. Why were you sigh, doing that big sigh at the beginning? It didn't, it didn't meld, it didn't flow together for me. You have an awesome talent, young lady. I really enjoy your, your speeches. So for me, you're very enthusiastic. You have your speech down. 
I would like to see it a little more rehearsed or I'm not quite sure why all the pauses were there. And then just talk to one person in the audience. I really enjoyed it. The pauses now that, that, I, that I think about it could have been because your internet was a little bit in and out. So I'm not sure if it was me or if it was your internet. So I could be out, out to lunch. I think this speech will eventually be presentation worthy for 3,000 people. Back to you, Toastmaster Carol. Thank you, Margaret, for that evaluation. I'm going to bring Dennis Dawson back to do a feedback of what he heard from the evaluators. Please welcome Dennis Dawson. All right. Three strong evaluations again. Cheryl. Yes, you started off by saying it was an interesting speech. That's one of those words that can uh, seem to have quotation marks around it. So if you're going to say interesting speech, it's a good idea to follow up with exactly what you found that was interesting, because I believe you were sincere in that saying you found it interesting uh, content. You said it toward the end. But again, you leave it with the uh, perception that you might be being ironic as you say that. In the, okay, I, I'm jumping around a bit. Uh, I like the way that you called out the demonstration of visuals. So I thought that that, that was good. Uh, your, yeah, you called out the need to slow down and at the, same time you gave a possible explanation for why that can happen. That's a nice technique to give somebody an out for why something might have worked the way it did in this particular case. So uh, that's a strong thing to do. I thought your use of eye language was very good. I thought it was an astute observation that there was good information, but it felt rushed. And that the uh, more stories would actually have helped with this. I, I agreed with that as well. So overall, uh, nice, uh, strong evaluation. Janet. There was a certain amount of rewriting of the speech in your evaluation that I, I didn't quite agree with. First of all, as, as you started your evaluation, you were about a minute in, and we, we are recording this. It might be good to, to watch the recording. Uh, it took you a minute before you gave any feedback about the speech. Up to that point, you talked in, in uh, generalities about it, that it was an inspiring speech. Uh, that you learn something uh, from her motivational speeches every single time, uh, but you didn't actually get into any useful content uh, for a full minute. And in a three minute evaluation, that's a problem. You also summarize the speech to a certain extent. You suggested that she start with a question, and this is another trope that I'm seeing in Toastmaster speeches all too often. Starting with a, a, a question is really overworked. And this is one of those things where if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So uh, be careful about suggesting that. Uh, if you wouldn't want to suggest that every time you hear uh, a speech, 
because that's, uh, again, falling back on things that you've heard before. A couple of places you also spoke for the audience where you said we all appreciated this and we want to avoid that as well. Okay. All right, Margaret, I, I thought you made some good points about uh, pausing and uh, pointing out that it, it actually affected the flow of the speech. And so it's not just that you uh, said that uh, that there were too many pauses, but you gave good examples for why you felt that way. Yes, uh, the sigh, That's, I'm trying to read my own notes here. The sigh at the beginning of the speech, very astute. Uh, that, that was an interesting way to begin the speech. And I, this was beginning in medias race. And this was particularly strong in Ravi's case where he starts off with the, the big uh, intense scene that was the cornerstone of his speech, went on to talk about some other things. Then he circled back to this very important scene. So that's, that's a technique that you'll see very often in movies. They'll start with the, the traumatic event, then they'll go back and they'll recap the story and, and bring you up to how you got to that point. So uh, that can be extremely effective. But in your case, Melissa, you didn't actually go back to the sign. <laughs> and so uh, it took away the, the power of that and actually confused things a bit. So I thought that was uh, very effective. Uh, one thing I'll remind you about, though, Margaret, is be sure that you're evaluating the speech you heard today and not all the speeches that the person has ever given. Uh, in this particular case, you were giving her props for the way she typically does, uh, gives her speeches, and you were uh, pointing out some ways that she uh, slipped up from her normal uh, high degree of uh, accomplishment, which is better than uh, the other way around, where you say, uh, generally, you're, you're terrible, and today you were great, <laughs> which we definitely don't want to uh, say to people. But be sure, be sure that you're looking at the speech that they're giving today, giving them uh, feedback based on the criteria for the lesson that they're doing. The one thing that I, I thought was missing, Melissa, if this is uh, for the uh, engaging humor uh, path, there wasn't a lot of engaging humor in this particular speech. There was a little bit, but you could have juiced up the humor a little bit in this speech to make it fit the overall path as opposed to this specific lesson. I thought it was a very informative speech that you gave. Uh, the one piece of feedback I would give you, just as I use the uh, compass for the compassionate candor, and I show the four quadrants, uh, this speech that, that you gave could definitely have used some visual aids so that uh, as one of the uh, evaluators pointed out, we wouldn't have to remember this. Uh, uh, yes, the uh, conscious competence, unconscious competence, conscious incompetence, unconscious incompetence, which is really useful. I'm going to steal that and pretend I made it up later on. Uh, but uh, if, if we'd had a visual for that, we could have been listening to you instead of my mind wandering and, and trying to remember what it was that you said at the beginning and how it applied to the various uh, parts of your speech. So this, you know, very few people are going to tell you, wow, you need more PowerPoint, but this would have been one of those times as far as I'm concerned. Great, well, thanks very much. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you all evaluators and speakers for tonight. Uh, this was quite informative. Now uh, everyone can open, uh, begin their video. And if you'd like to talk or ask any questions about tonight to Dennis or overall, how, how was everybody tonight? Yes, Margaret. I have a question. In Ravi's speech, he said, avoid, avoid, and, 
and Bayes. His pronunciation wasn't quite crisp. I just chatted with that with Ravi to tell him, is that something you would include in your evaluation? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, we go. I feel better now. That's the sort of thing. This is one of the uh, advantages of being in a club with someone and seeing them give speeches over time. And uh, as I said, you evaluate the speech that you heard today. So if you heard a mispronunciation of a word today, and it's a key word like it was to that particular speech, I think it's just fine to call it out. However, if week after week, there's someone in your club who, for whom English is not their first language, and they make similar sorts of mistakes, then you wouldn't want to call it out every time they speak, because then you're just beating them over the head with something that they're obviously continuing to work on. Uh, Ravi, do you have a thought on that? You're raising a finger. I wanted to ask a question. Uh, so, Margaret, you're talking about wave, right? Wave. Wave. It's, okay. To me, it sounded like a W. Wave. wave. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Any other word? Avoid. 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 Okay. Was avoid. And it's picky, but at this point. No, it's, it's okay. I, I agree. I agree. Just any other word? That was what I heard. I don't want to open it up, but I think that were, those were the two big ones that I heard. Okay. Okay. I'll work on them. Thank, I just know you know this stuff. It was just what no, I heard. I, I know about the wave, but uh, it comes out unconsciously, you know? Yep. I need to change my circuits in the brain to fix these vocabulary. <laughs> well, you're a smart guy. You can do it. But this uh, is such an important uh, lesson, Margaret, and thank you for demonstrating it. Uh, Robbie is not trying to talk to 10 people at the back of the Denny's. He wants to win the international speech contest. And if one old judge like me, I can't understand what that guy's saying. Is he saying have? or Maeve, I don't know what he's doing. I'm just going to vote for somebody else. Okay. And that happens because uh, Toastmasters judges and Toastmasters contests are just Toastmasters. They're not experts. They're not uh, in any way qualified other than the fact that they've been in Toastmasters for six months and they've given uh, six speeches or completed two paths. So giving people really useful feedback that way is vital. Uh, even if it is something that's a little awkward to talk about. Yeah, Ravi. Uh, yes, Dennis, you were talking about fluidi fluidity and many people have mentioned about the pauses. So mm -hmm. in summary, you think my preparation is good enough to tell unconsciously, but it feels as if I'm repeating something. It's not like talking to a person. That's the summary. That's what I hear from everybody, right? many people, correct? Yeah, and again, some people think, oh, well, what I'll do is put my speech aside and I'll just tell it again. And now uh, it'll come out more natural because I'm not so rehearsed. Okay, so Dennis, I reduce the pauses a little bit and I can add them. Now, one technique is I'll do that. I'll add pauses at least one second between every story. There are three to four stories, okay? Three stories, one conclusion. I will add pauses everywhere. Okay, that's first tip. What else? How else can I make it feel more natural? Okay, Ed, you, uh, you cut me off before I finish that entire thought because it's more rehearsal that makes you sound less rehearsed. Yeah, I can't stress that enough. It, it's just so ingrained in your head that you're not struggling to remember what to say next and you're not you, you don't have to have your speech in your head like a train uh, set of train cars in a caboose that you're just uh, flowing. Now, part of this is the way it's written. And I think your speech is well written in terms of uh, the way it, uh, you transition from one thought to the next. I, I think that it's got a very logical flow. Uh, so that, that's not going to be the issue that trips you up. It's, it's really just rehearsing, 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 telling it again and again. Yeah, I understand, Dennis. No, and, and 
I need to where I where I, I really want to uh, the two things I never do I never script this is where I'm going to pause and I never script this is where I'll gesture like this but now I'll gesture like that and write that down no I give the speech and let the gestures form organically and if I find one that that fits I'll go oh I like that and I'll just remember to do it the next time I speak but a, a lot of yours with the and you know, I'm walking along the, the bottom of the river and all of these things, they're okay, but they're obviously stylized. Yes. And that's, that's the thing that you, you wanna avoid. It's, it's the difference between, and then I was walking along the river as opposed, and then I was walking along the river bottom, you know, and you throw it in and you throw it out. Does anybody else have any questions for Dennis? I just have one question. Ravi, when you were telling your story about your grandfather, and maybe this would be too cheesy in a contest, I don't know. But if you would go, mm, like a big smooch kind of thing, I thought that would have made it really funny. Yeah, yes, yes. I was waiting for that. Yeah, I, I'll add it, I'll add it. Actually, it is in the script. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't know if that would be a right thing in an international speech contest, but when I was wait, I was sitting there and I thought he's going to give his grandpa a big smooch and then I didn't. I just thought so, it was funny. So this is what you're saying. It is pretty traumatic to learn that your grandfather is your first kisser. Well, and, and once again, are, are you really visualizing your grandfather coming close? Because it does not appear to me that you're thinking about what it really looked like, what it really felt like when your grandfather uh, planted the big kiss, the kiss of life on you. And so if you're envisioning that really clearly, it comes across in your body language automatically. And so you're going to wince, you're gonna pull back from that, or you're going to lean into the camera. My first kiss, was from my grandfather. Me personally, it would be like this for me. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there is no correct way to do it. As Margaret just said, I leaned in, she leans back, but we're doing it in a way that is true to us. So be sure you're doing it in a way that feels true to you. And then we can all go along with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like this idea of my grandfather is your first kisser. I like that one. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't like the kiss on the screen. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. But Ravi, uh, sometimes we throw stuff at the wall and see what works. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to your point, Cheryl, you pointed out a place where there was an uh, opportunity for more humor to come through. And uh, that's just, as you say, throwing an idea out discussing it a little bit, thinking it through, coming up with something that works better for Ravi. But you pointed out the fact that there was something needed there. And that's very useful feedback. Okay. And uh, Dennis, what are the other spots? It did not look natural. What are the other spots? It looked uh, like a playing some, uh, like something in a movie or a thing, you know? That was the main... Uh, what are the other spots that did not look natural? I, I found it interesting that you said, as your daughter was washed out to sea, she was my only child. The way you said it made me think, well, if you had more than one child, you could afford to lose one. So it wouldn't, wouldn't be so, <laughs> so Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so in that case, I was about to lose my only child. That's different than, I was losing my only child. I had to go make another. I was about to lose my only child. Okay. Uh, but uh, think about it then. Uh, it, it's the, it changes the emphasis in the way you say it. I was about to lose my only child. I, I like it. I like it. I'm taking it. Janet, you had a, a question? 
Yeah, yeah, two places where I thought the expressions could use a little more animation was um, I loved the 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 fear. I love this gesture. It's this girl, but the face didn't always match. Okay, yeah. you have a you you have almost an ironic face, wait, the, a, an ironic resting face, and that's what you had sometimes with the with the fear. Okay. And the other one was. Um, at the end when she's smiling. You know, if you did a little kid smile, when you say it, she was smiling. When I would have been terrified out of my mind, you know, kids. <laughs> so that, that's two places you- Yeah, I, um, I, I know this. The ironical face is actually really comical to watch as you're telling a good part of this story, but there are a few spots where if you had that little extra emotion showing in the face, my God, like- I, I want to try that out. Fear, I, I don't know, like, you know, I'm not good at expressing fear. Fear, you know? Yeah. Fear. I hear in Sweden, fear. their top fear is sharks and they're a landbound country. Someone pointed that out to me. <laughs> so, you know, like why are you shared a scarch? I don't know, because they got big teeth. So, yeah, I don't know what, what you need to think about when you're seeing that. Yeah. But uh, to Janet's point, this is a very strong gesture that, that did convey fear, even if it didn't come across in your face as strongly. So yeah. that, that is something you can work on. Also point out, Janet, that those were two very astute observations that would have been in your evaluation if you had had more time to work on it. And so yeah, everybody, Please understand, I know that normally in a meeting, you've got table topics between the speech and your evaluation. You have plenty of time to think these things through and pull them out. So uh, kudos to all of you for stepping up and doing the evaluations with such little time to prepare. Oh, can I ask you a question? Guys, so you guys did not see fear in my face. That's the bottom line, correct? Joan, do you want to say something? Joan, you're... Joan? If you want your story to be believable, you have to feel the story. When you feel the story, then it comes across to your audience a lot stronger and when you feel it, your face shows it, your body gestures become more natural. So what, what I was taught a long time ago was to write your speeches and then you visualize your speech, each portion of it. And where there's emotion, you actually feel that emotion and it will show in your face and come across to your audience. So if when you're talking about your daughter going out to sea and you look like you're just reading a story, it doesn't come across as your daughter going out to sea. You should look horrified at least most people should. <laughs> so this, uh, this fear expression, it did not even come across in the first three sentences. No. Even when I said <clears throat> that did not. No, you've got, if you feel it, it will show. But if you're trying to show a certain gesture, it will often come across as something that you threw in to try and make a point, but it doesn't come across heartfelt. Heartfelt is what gets you to the international. Yes, when, when, you, when you do that gesture, you, it seems as if you're focused on the gesture and not on the emotion that would lead to that gesture. So Joan is spot on. Spot on. <laughs> yeah. 
in order to show my face gesture i need to stop all other gestures <laughs> you know what i'm saying i can't have a i mean i i i got it oh, i love your gestures <laughs> no 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 yeah i'm i'm telling if i have the gestures people people will look at my gestures gestures but uh, there should be a spot in which i should stop and just show the expressions on my face okay and uh, yeah i don't have any props what do you guys think i don't think you need them i don't think you need them either ravi i mean i can put some goggles but i don't like using props until they are really you know adding value it's like you know in order to just get some points i might add them but no no i uh, again if if you're visualizing then it, it will come across in your gestures and uh, this isn't uh, a comical speech yeah you using props with it would make it comical putting on goggles that's that's going to be a big laugh getter i don't think that that would fit the the tone yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i got it the main main thing is main takeaway is it's not natural it's uh, yeah it's look it looks fine the gestures and everything but somehow your face is not in appropriate with that story one thing that you can try is to start up a zoom meeting and record it and give the speech just you recorded in zoom and don't use any of your planned gestures just tell the story okay when you feel that you have to gesture go ahead but don't do any of the practiced ones okay now that doesn't mean you won't uh, incorporate them the very next time you do it but see how it feels to give the speech without the gestures and see how you look as you give the speech without the gestures i like the idea I actually was thinking when I heard it that your cadence when your daughter was going out might have been a little faster because you were scared and fearful so you would speed up that speech and not excitement but in, as in you know and and then all of a sudden your ego fast in and the then it's opening? like you in got the it in the opening or in the conclusion in the opening where just just because you're creating you you're taking that audience on the journey and you're kind of so it's not the same tempo like throughout the whole that's what i was thinking okay so you does that make sense you guys never heard a low tone right well cadence is your rhythm mm -hmm. so if you continue to talk like this there is no slowness or fastness you know that she was just being taken straight out to the water so there you're creating that suspense and yeah. shock so you don't hear that you talk faster <laughs> okay okay the, I, the tiger jumped out of the woods and he took grabbed me by the neck and i swung my arms all around and i threw the tiger across the woods you know cuz oh. it's in the middle of the hour <laughs> i don't know about you when I remember specifically my daughter one time I was watching television and I turned and looked at my daughter she was 2 she had wrapped a very thin dog leash around her neck about 10 times the handle of the leash was hooked onto the handlebars of an exercise bicycle and she was teetering on the pedal of the exercise bicycle and she was standing 2 feet away from me and i hadn't seen her do this in that moment time practically stood still and a kind of calmness came over me that i have never experienced in any other situation i reached over I gave her a little hug and I slowly unwrapped the dog leash placed her on the ground and then I fell to pieces 
So think about how you actually felt in that moment. Sometimes uh, things are going really quickly, but a lot of times when the adrenaline's pumping, the whole world slows down. Yeah, actually- you Focus on the details. Yeah. Actually, when it really happened, everything went like that. I don't really even know how long it took. Everything was fast. Everything was very, very fast. Yeah. Uh, and, and you can incorporate that. I know it's, it's late to rewrite the speech, but you can incorporate that notion in there, convey it. Go ahead. I can make the opening faster. The three lines, the four lines in the opening, I can make them faster. And I can slow down at that one. Yeah. The third one. I, I think that would be really effective. Yeah. Okay. I can speed down. I can speed it up. I can speed it up. The three lines I'll speed it up. Speed it up to the point where you're still being understood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, we also have New Hall, uh, New Ha here, and Alan and Brittany, Max and Carolyn. Thank you, everybody. We lost Dorothy already. Uh, the time. This, I hope Ravi has been very helpful, Melissa, and to all the evaluators, thank you so much for doing that quick evaluation and Dennis for coming. This will be seen not just by our club, but other clubs in our area as well. So it, yes, it will be recorded. <laughs> yes, any other comments? Wonderful. Thank you very much for coming. You guys are welcome to stay and chat some more.